Um, so today I wanted to talk about effective communication um, with other people. Um, I think that a lot of problems that we have in within our community, within the world, within ourselves can be resolved by communicating effectively with each other. And I think that a lot of times people really do not know how communication works. Um, we don't people don't realize or understand that when you're communicating with someone, you have your own thoughts, ideas, and beliefs that you're bringing to the conversation. So what that means is that our past always influence how we're thinking about the present and how we're thinking about our future, right? So let's just say that I'm talking to you and you're saying like, hey, you know, um, I'm just say something that's like the general statement that I hear in a community all the time. Um, why is it that um, Muslim men all they want to marry is kufars? You know, some something like that. You know, and then a man would get defensive, like, no, it's because you know y'all women y'all don't know how to respect a woman, so we like to go outside or whatever. And yeah, they don't respect y'all don't black women or Muslim women, whatever the case may be. It'd be some weird, strange conversations that people have. Um, and it's because what they're doing is they're not really communicating what they feel. You're not saying, I feel like I'm unwanted because you don't pick people that look like me. That's not what they want to say. What they're going to just do is accuse you of doing something and then the other person gets defensive and they're like well it's because you don't instead of saying well i don't feel like i'm valued in relationships in my community because when you say something like that doesn't that make you feel more empathetic to what the person is saying like dang i'm i'm so sorry that i didn't even think about that you don't feel like I respect you or that you're valuable. And what you said to me was you feel like you're unlovable because someone that looks like you is not willing to love you. That's a whole different kind of conversation. And it's an intimate conversation. Intimacy transcends problems. So when you take a, like people, they don't like being vulnerable because they feel like people will take advantage of them and that um, it makes them look weak. But really it's very, that's strength. Do you know how hard it is to put your emotional feelings on the line and say, I feel like this when this is happening. That's a source of strength. And if someone takes advantage of that, it doesn't have anything to do with you being weak. It has everything to do with them being a predator. And so how? So how? What? I'm sorry. So sometimes we personalize other people's behavior, and we allow other people to change who we are, which is then we don't wind up having intimacy, which would then we don't have fulfilling relationships with other people. So what's the main factor that's preventing people from having good conversation or communication skills with each other? What are the uh, the blocks of it is blocking or preventing us? I think it's a few things. Uh, one is conditioning, how we were raised to believe we should communicate with each other. But I think the biggest thing is fear. And I would say fear is false evidence appearing real. So we fear that if we are vulnerable, that means someone is going to take advantage of us. And then that means that we are weak. When really it's, I was vulnerable to have a good and intimate relationship. Someone took advantage of that and they are a predator. Does it happen more with women or with men or equally both? Equally both. I think women happen to be more expressive but it's still not intimate. You know, they may be like, they may say they hurt my feelings or something like that, but 
it's still not an intimate conversation because it's still they still always try to blame the other person for the way they feel and i i hear people and i see people all the time when they'll say um you people talk about they say people talk about how i reacted to a situation but they never talk about what you did to me to make me react that way and I tell people you reacted that way because that's who you are. It had mm-hmm. nothing to do with the other person. And I don't know if you remember this, but I used to, I always use the analogy of me slapping four people. I could slap four different people and they all respond differently. It's because mm-hmm. of how they respond is who they are. What I'm doing is just a stimuli. Where like even with like women, like sometimes when we can um, conversate with each other. Um, like sometimes if I had something really, really exciting to tell one of my friends, I might come in, but like, bitch, let me tell you. And they'd be like, what, what, what? And it's exciting. But then you might have somebody else come and they be like, um, they might try to do the same exact thing. You'd be like, why are you disrespecting me like that? Don't talk to me about that. Like that. Because when we communicate with each other, it's about perception of what's happening. People think that when you're communicating, it's all about what the person is actually saying. That is like, and I'm just saying hypothetically because I don't know exactly, but it's like 10% of communication. It's also body language because I can say something right now to you and you might be like, oh, okay, I understand. Then I might change my tone or change my body language and it's going to communicate something different. And what happens is I'm leaving you up to interpret what I am trying to say and what I'm trying to communicate. So body language is very, very important in, in communicating. Absolutely. I think it's more important than what the words are actually saying. Because I can tell you how hurt I am and I'm crying. And you're like, oh, mm-hmm. she's really hurt. But then I can be talking about how hurt I am, but I'm yelling at you. It's just going to make you defensive. Like, oh, she disrespected me, blah, 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 blah. But I'm still hurt. I'm still communicating the same words. But the way I'm behaving is making you interpret it differently and this does culture uh bear any factors in this because i like i lived overseas right and like i lived in the middle east so some arabs not all like i lived in egypt some of them they like to scream and shout and it's normal you mm-hmm. and a, a person from not the cult from not within that culture see it they think they're fighting but in reality they're not fighting this is a normal yes. conversation Yes, culture has a uh, culture has a lot to do with a lot of things because even if you think about um um I don't remember exactly who the story was about in, in regards to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam time, but I remember it was a guy who was, wanted to complain about his wife, so he was going to one of the companions to complain about his wife, you know, yelling and stuff at him. When he got there, the companion was getting cussed out basically by his wife. And he was like, I heard, and then when a companion asked him, like, I heard that you was by my house. He was like, well, I was going to complain about my wife, but you were too. He said, but that woman bared my children. It was Umar, yeah. Radhi Allah, yeah, yeah, the Hadith Umar. Yeah. And people like, like, this is the Caliph of Islam and how his wife is yelling at him. And he said, this is my wife or something like but the children of my mother or something mm-hmm. like this. Right? Yeah. And he was going to him for advice about his wife uh, screaming and yelling and stuff. Yes. Yeah. And, it's, and, it's, and, that, and even in that, sometimes people think that because culture also mean culture always mean the dominant culture. Mm-hmm. You and your family of origin can have your own culture. You know, so in that, the way he grew up or however the case may have been, that may have been okay in his family. And it was like, we respect our women. You know, they have this, blah, 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 blah. And again, like, it's always about how we interpret information. Because in that, you know, that family of origin, they may not have been considered disrespect. They could, like, just being, she is emotional. She is expressing her feelings. And this is not disrespect. In someone else's family, it may be considered disrespect. But however, we got to also know that we have to start learning when something is disrespect versus someone that's my preference i got you so this is a big question right here so how about partners how partners should communicate with each other how to actively listen to others and why it's important yes so within partnerships right one Mm -hmm. the i always i think that especially in today's time everybody should get 
premarital counseling because then it goes through communication and how um, people communicate with each other. Um, like, so me, the way I'm a, the kind of, the way that I communicate is that if I have a problem about something, I try to figure out what was your thought process behind something that you, you've done. Right. So like for me, I might like say if, you didn't wash the dishes. I'm upset that you didn't wash the dishes. I saw you walk past the dishes three, four, five times and you didn't touch them. I might be like, hey, are you are you okay? What's going on with you? Mm. And then you might say, I got a lot on my mind. I was stressed about work. I was stressed about this, blah, 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 blah. And then guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to forget about the dishes. Who cares? That's an unimportant. You know? Um, but sometimes I think people skip over to straight accusations. You just walked past the dishes three times, you know, blah, 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 and you didn't, yada, yada, yada. But let's just say, especially like safety and polygyny, right? And you don't know at the other house the wife is sick or whatever, whatever the case may be. So he's worried about that, but he here with you because that's his obligation. And you didn't take in consideration that things may be going on with him too. And vice versa. Hey, I noticed that, you know, the house been untidy, blah, blah, blah. Instead of saying that, like, hey, you know, especially if you know somebody's like a clean person. Hey, I noticed that, you know, you haven't been cleaning. Are you okay? Is something going on? And I might be like, you know, my friend, oh, you know, whatever the case may be. But first inquire about what's going on with people before you just um, quick to tear people a new one. You know, I think that people, they become narcissistic in that way and that's one of the things that i hate when people they start throwing away they start throwing around that term narcissism and oh he was narcissistic and so were you too mm, both of them being toxic basically no not being toxic we all have some narcissistic tendencies it's mm. just it's just um it's just life you know even down to like if you take like the like narcissistic personality disorder out of let's just say narcissism just in it of itself it just means someone who is something that is you become self-centered about right mm -hmm. but that's the extreme version but in general don't you eat food don't when your stomach start to growl you eat right that's you thinking about you that's like the foundation of what narcissism is, is you thinking about yourself well i'm thinking about myself when i pray because i'm trying to get a little some um, closer to a law so I can get the gender. That's narcissism. It's all, We all have pieces of it. If not, we will all die. Literally, we would die. If, when you come out the womb of your mother, you are narcissistic. Like, it's all about you. You don't start growing out of that until almost late teens, early adulthood when you start to think about other people. It becomes... So, a, it becomes, becomes who you are? It becomes extreme if you couple it with trauma. And then that's when it becomes extreme. And then people can't think outside of that. But so in with, general, that, mm, I'm that's, sorry. That's, no, that's it. in general, though, we all have some narcissistic tendencies. It's just the reality. So, so my question is, um, how would communication skills with our partner how would that transfer into uh, society as a whole? If I'm if I'm not a good communicator with my partner or spouse, then maybe I'm most likely not a good communicator with people outside my house. Is this so? Absolutely. But I do want to finish answering the other question that you had about communicating with your partner and how to listen. So when you are talking to your partner also too, it's important that not to have expectations. Right. So what I mean by expectations, it shouldn't be that, hey, if I walk past the dishes three times, I would have washed them at least on the second time I walk past them because they're not you. They don't think like you. That's just it. Period. I mean, don't think about dishes. I'm not, you know that right now. I know. But I use that as as a simple example, because if I make it too complex, it's going to roll right over people here. Mm -hmm. You really have to stop and think. I always tell people, this is how I, I do it. What I would say, what I am upset about it, is it wrong in a technical sense? Like, did they cheat? Did they lie? Did they steal? Did they kill? Are they 
committing sure like is this something that's major no it's not okay is it a preference yes it's a preference so that means my approach is going to be different versus something that's wrong that everybody in this uh world will say that is wrong versus hey this is my opinion and this is something that i don't like because if it's something that i don't like I want to say, hey, I really don't like X, Y, and Z because of whatever. However, I know it's not your responsibility to make me happy in this area because it's my stuff. But I'm hoping as my partner, we can accommodate me and we can make some concessions and meet in the middle. So to meet in the middle with those dishes, hey, if you walk past them, would it be possible if you can wash them? If you can't, can you at least say, hey, babe, I know I walk past the dishes, but I got a lot going on. Can I do them another time? Hmm. You know, and communicate that. But we know what we do as people, and we both do it, men and women. We think people mind readers. I would have did this so why wouldn't they? Because they ain't you. Like, hmm. if everybody was like you, this place would be a very boring place. No one would talk to each other. Because why Why would we need to talk when I know what you're about to say? Because I'm about to say it too. we are both about to say it. How can we learn? How can we get to know one each other? How can we, you know, this world go around if everybody is the same? It just doesn't make sense. But we take that to a whole nother level that we think that people can read our minds and do what we think that they should be doing. When that's not even a, that's not even the case. Nobody's like you. And you shouldn't want nobody like be like you. Like, listen, it's only you know everybody else is taking up. I'd rather be me, and that's it. But then, when you're communicating with somebody, I always tell you before you go into explaining yourself about whatever it is, make sure you understand what they're saying. Repeat back what they said in your own words. So if you like, oh, you walked past the dishes three times, you didn't wash them. So what I hear you saying is that you seem a little bit upset that I walked past the dishes and didn't wash them. Because then she, they going to say yes or no. Or they might ask somebody, no, I said three times, you know, being petty, you know, but whatever. It gives them the opportunity to correct you because people sometimes don't always communicate what they need either. They just they might say something very vaguely. And I know I get a bad rep for this because I'll ask questions. Maybe like, isn't it obvious? And I'll be like, no, I'm just making sure that what my idea of what you're talking about is the same idea of what you're talking about. I don't want to make any assumptions because, you know, think about um, how many words we have for money, right? We got moolah, bread, guap, whatever. But I might go somewhere else and I might say those things. They'd be like, I don't know what that means or it may mean something different to them, you know, like soda and pop. I might go and be like, yeah, I want a pop. And if I'm down south and I say, I want a pop, it, you know, I want a soda down here. If you say, I want a pop, I want some of your soda, <laughs> mm. you know? So if we coming from different cultures, the same words may not always mean the same. So you should, that's why I tell them you should always reflect back what they say, but in your own words to make sure that they are aligned with each other yeah, communication seems like for um marital uh, discord or marital problem it's the number one thing uh spouses um so it's finances is money it's money and commu money and communicate it's money it's money it's money it's money i know people are married they don't they, they don't speak each other language and as long as the money good the marriage is good and the money is not good. Yeah. Right, not good. Don't even speak each other language. <laughs> money uh, is the number one um, cause of marital discord. Which it shouldn't be. Mm, unfortunately. If you, the, if you follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it wouldn't be an issue. Yeah. To modern women, I think it's, it's, it's I don't know, I think because the lifestyle, not just being a modern woman, but in modern society, it's very much of, uh, 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 so if you're poor, uh, you know, what type of burden you're going to go through due to it. So I can see why people fight over it, right? Um, 
So related to being an active listener, mm -hmm. uh, how does communication skills between uh, one spouse, how does that transfer with now communicating with people outside? So the sad part about it is when people communicate with people outside, guess what they do? They, this is when they follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They gave people 70 concessions for other people outside the home. When the people that's inside your home, they got to deal with your, your bull crap. Hmm. You, you, got so, you got no patience with them. But hmm. when it comes to your boss, everybody, you, you chuck it up. You listen to what, you, what they say. You, may, you don't say anything back. And um, I think that's wrong. Uh, I think it's very backwards. Um, I give people more heat that don't live in my house than people that don't live in my house than people. I give more heat to people that don't live in my house than the people that do. Because my family deserve the best of me. Mm -hmm. And I think people have gotten away from that where, you know, especially, and I'm going to say this for women, because um, I don't know about men, but I know for women, you know, I ain't going to be no housewife. I'm not going to listen to my husband. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. But then you go to work. And you let somebody else map out your whole entire day. When you can take breaks. How long you can take a break. How much you're going to get paid. You do all of this for your boss. You go above and beyond. Because you say, hey, I want that promotion. Blah, blah, blah. I want this and I want that. And you'll do this all for your boss, all for a company. But then you go home and you tell the person that loves you. I ain't listen to nothing you're saying. That is so strange to me. That is the most strangest thing to me in the world. And I hear it sometimes because I I only talk to, about women and I think that's what I think another problem that people have when it comes like to podcasts and stuff like that people always want to talk about what the opposite sex is not doing when you don't know the struggles of the opposite sex and why they're behaving that way you just see the behaviors yeah mm -hmm. so that's why like for me I might say like you know as a community like statistically yeah men should start taking care of uh, their wives like they should but I'm not going to say why they're not doing it. I mean, I might say like, oh, because it's not past that. I might say general statements. But sometimes I feel like people, both sides, be going too hard on the opposite. But what are you doing? Because the only person that you can change is you. And I say this in therapy too. I always ask, because um, I do a lot of therapy with women. I ask them, because, you know, we're natural caretakers. And I ask us. How hard is it to change yourself? You know, they always say, oh, it's so hard to change. You know, it takes me a long time. I said, so why do you expect to change someone else? That's very true. You know, in Islam, um, when it comes to communication skills, I was just reading an article preparing for this talk uh, from a psych uh, psychology point of view of uh, communication, right? Mm -hmm. And about being an active listener, I was thinking over... Uh, one of my studies about an Arabic language, we say, what is kalam? What is speech, right? Mm -hmm. And this goes back to the essentials of Islam and Islamic yes. science. We say in Arabic language, al kalam huwa lafsal marakam al bil wadi', right? And it has a meaning related to the Arabic language and its usage, but in the Arabic language, it must be beneficial for the person you're speaking to that they understand what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. So, in Islam, part of a um, uh, scholar or a student of knowledge or a good listener, that you will find that some of the biggest scholars were good listeners. And they used to sit down and listen to what people had to say. They would sit yeah. down, l observe, listen, and they would be with the uh, average Muslim, right? The average people, the layman peoples, and they will listen to their concerns and deal with them. Right. Mm -hmm. I noticed in today's time, some Muslim scholars don't even mix mm -hmm. with the average person. Right. Mm -hmm. um, back with communication skills, 
you'll find that some people, like I hear uh, some women, when they complain about the husband, well, when the husband's outside the home, he has the best character, best character. Mm -hmm. But in the house, he's the opposite person, right? And then for the good marriages, where people don't complain, the husband and or the and the wife, they're the best listeners outside the home, inside the home. And you can see the reflection with their children, right? Mm -hmm. You can see how they interact is very good. So with listening skills now, on um, how 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 to be a lot of us we don't know how to be active quiet, listeners quiet. or good communication skills a lot of us we don't know <laughs> but you know the biggest problem with active listening is again people what they do is they allow their own experiences to influence <laughs> what their people are saying to them and that's the worst kind of thing you're doing is because now you're interpreting it differently than what the person is actually saying. So you have to strip all of that away. And what may make it easier, and this is something that I do for myself, is when people are talking to me, I, I say, I wonder why they think like that. I don't say, oh, they think like that because X, Y, and Z. Be a curious listener. like. Be curious about why somebody is thinking that, why they're talking that way. Because when you become curious, you stop thinking about what they truly mean. And let's just say, because, you know, and I'm, and I'm going to give you an example. I have uh, one of my ex-husbands, he loved to joke, loved to joke. And I couldn't stand none of his jokes. I thought none of them was funny. Other people might have enjoyed his jokes. I didn't think none of them were funny, but it's because I believe that he was just a malicious person. Was so he it joking about you? Was it, he joking it'd about been you? anybody. No, it would have been anybody. Oh. It, okay. And I used to be like, why would you say that? That's very malicious. Because I just believe that he was a malicious person. Mm -hmm. But I had other exes, but we are bust on each other all the time. And it used to be the most funniest thing ever. But because I didn't believe that they intended ill harm to anybody yeah, they just want to lighten moods and stuff like that so you always have to pay attention to what your own beliefs is about what's happening but the people say some jokes have certain percentage of truth behind them when people that's say the them. best jokes that's the best jokes and that's why i don't funny. i don't joke with women i don't joke with women or spouse because that brings problems <laughs> Well, you just haven't found the right one because me and the ex, we used to bust on each other and stuff like that. And it used to be so funny. Um, but again, it's about what do you believe about that person? You know, because if you believe that that person is malicious, it don't matter. It could be the most funniest joke. You would have could have thought that they was like a Kevin Hart if you didn't know him. But it's not funny because I believe you're malicious. And beliefs have a lot to do with how you interpret something, you know. So, you know, you know but in, in Islam, when it comes to communication and speaking, you know, the Prophet, this is a hadith. The Prophet oh. sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu uh, hayin wa layin was hurima ala nar, kullu hayin wa layin wa sahal wa qareeb ila nas, right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Forbidden for the fire. Kuluhayin walayin. Layin means easy going. Person who is easy going. Lane means soft spoken. Kari, mm -hmm. uh, easy accessible. Uh, meaning that when a person talks and deal with a person, anybody's approachable to him. He's easy going. He's close to the people. He's easy with himself. And he's easy with others. Right. That's also part of communication. When you say layin, that means soft spoken. Mm -hmm. And dealing with people's right, so we understand that being soft spoken or uh, in the form of communication is very important. You have some people's, you know, uh, I think including myself in writing that a lot of people when I write, people say you sound aggressive in you, in my writing. But when I'm writing for myself, when I'm writing and I'm talking about religion. You know, I'm going to talk like how a lawyer would talk about legal stuff, right? So 
to you, to that other person, it might feel harsh, but I'm not being harsh, right? I'm explaining things. But for some person who might interpret the same thing, they might say, okay, this brother, he's teaching something. Mm -hmm. Another person might see it and say it's uh, 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 it's harsh. So do, is, 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 are we lost a little bit? Communication is misunderstood when we're like on social media, talking, texting to people, emails. Is there a little bit of loss of communication? People could get things misunderstood. Yes, because you know what? We have this, um, we talk about gentle parenting um, at the, my last podcast, which I think is a great thing with gentle parenting. But you know what the thing about it is, is that I think people think that just because you do something gently, that that means you downplay it. I could gently tell you the truth and it's still going to hurt and it's still going to seem aggressive because that's your interpretation of what's happening. People don't like being corrected. So they say that it's aggressive, but no, it's straightforward. It's assertive. I did say it gently because not being gentle could have been like, are you or like, so let's just say it's about something you talk about religion and I'm like, are you effing stupid? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, blah, blah. No, that's aggressive. That's me. But if I say, hey, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, don't fornicate. Stop doing it. It's not aggressive. It's straightforward. It's assertive. I'm just telling you what it is. It's no way around it. But see, what people want you to do is like, oh, well, is it something else you can do instead of having sex outside of marriage? Like, what do you think? No, it's, it's no other way to say it. Because if I say it other ways, then guess what? It leaves room for interpretation. That's mm. inaccurate. Because what we're going to do is the heart is, you know, is wicked. Okay? And mm. it's going to want to do what it wants to do. So if you don't say what it really is, it could be left up to the person to say, oh, you know, like I, like I had, um, just to give you an example, like I was... It was this uh, brother that I had knew and he was talking about um, like fornication. And so I was like, no, you, you just can't do that. I was like, that's not okay. He was like, no, I know it's not okay. He's like, but you know, a law is merciful. I said, I understand that a law is merciful, but that don't mean that just because he's merciful, you should go out and do it. He said, yeah, but he tried to use hadiths to support that. Basically, um, he could do whatever he wanted to do, but be repentant. Like that fine line of, and I was like, are you playing in the law's face? He's like, no, no, no. I'm not. I said, you you are. I said, because you're trying to justify. I said, I know we're all sinners. I know we're going to fall short. But the way you are talking is as if, let me do what I want. I can repent and it's going to be all good. And I'm going to rely on his mercy. Now, if somebody else who was, um, I don't want to say mean, but like just had a little bit less intelligence, they'll be like, Oh, see, yes. Or right, I shouldn't feel that bad. Let me just go out and, and live my life. And I'll just, you know, make Toba and now I'm going to be okay. And then you wonder why on a day of judgment, you like, a little like you getting a fire. You, you took oh, you a got an SPD. <laughs> oh, you got an SPD. Or that. But, you know, you, you can't do that. You have to mean what you say and say what you mean. And, and that's why I said, like, um, when I had said, like, people, be more gentle with people outside than inside their home. What I was meaning is that they take their a softer approach. I'm more softer really with my family than with people out in the streets. In the streets, I, I'm just gonna be like, this is what it is. Now with my children, I might say, hey, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said don't fornicate and the law said don't fornicate and whatever. So what's going on with you? Like, why do you think, and I might inquire more from them you know, just to get down to the bottom of it because I'm going to care for my family. That's a part of caring, but still holding them accountable. People on the streets, I'm just going to say, no, you can't do that. I was, I was, um, about CBT. I know you're, 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 you're a CPT, CBT, um, practitioner and CPT. Uh, I know that they gear away from asking, telling people what's wrong with them instead of they ask some questions to allow them to see the wrongness in themselves, right? This is one of the approaches in CBT. So um, I'm not a CBT practitioner. I utilize their techniques. Mm. Um, so with CBT, what they basically, they, 
Um, I'm more eclectic, so I don't want to really speak to strict CBT. That's what I lean more towards when it comes to counseling. So I, you know, I look at the behaviors, I look at the cognitions that influence the behaviors, and I see how they can change it. So, um, because in that approach, you can't be upfront sometimes. Like, for example, I noticed myself from being involved in Dawah. If I tell what I'm associated with, somebody I don't know or do know, I say, brother, that's haram. Or I give them some advice, religious advice. I have one of my friends, right? I hope you see this video, right? So I told him one day, I'm like, um, he was asking me for something, money. He was away studying or something like that. And I said straight up to him, something in the way I think, you know, why don't you come back and get a job for six months? Ain't nobody going to take care of you. You two, you grown man right now. Why don't you get a job? You, that stuff you away learning, you, you using this for excuse for like, what, five years now? No degree. People going to figure out you got no degree. You've been there for five years. You need to go get a job. Man, mad, upset, right? That was a four. And I'm being upfront with him. But if I turn around, if I look at some of the approaches with CBT, I'm gonna ask the, I would ask in a different way. For example, make him think for himself. Would it be better? Is it is another way you could do what you need to do to get what you need? Think of another way or give me an example on how you could uh, get this. You know, are these a better questions for communicating with people? Because sometimes the being forward for some people, I mean, I have a lot of people mad with me because I'm before with them and I have a straight face. I'm not yelling, not screaming, but a lot of people don't want to hear the up forward things. Is it better to use those approaches? It depends on a person. Um, My friend is hard headed. He's hard headed. Yeah, he so speaks to me like for two years now. He's, so, he's so yeah, hard headed hard-headed. people's uh, CBT approaches will work better because it makes them feel like that they came up with the idea. Somebody like me using CBT approaches don't work. And you need reason, DBT. You need huh? DBT, right? No, no, I don't need DBT. Just say what you gotta say, because say. Uh, yeah, just say what like just say it. Because when when people have an ulterior motives and are trying to get me to think of something on my own, again, I told you, I think because I've been a therapist for way too long, I don't come with assumptions about what you're trying to tell me. So when you're asking me a question where you're trying to get me to somewhere that you want me to go, I'm going to be like, I have no idea where you're trying to go. Like, just say it. And then if you say it and I agree with you, then I'm like, oh, I agree. And if I agree with part of that, I might say, I agree with this part, but I don't agree with this part because this is for me. And then it's other, like, cause you know, I'm in therapy now and I'm about to change my therapist because she keep trying to do a uh, motivational interviewing on me. And I'm just like, stop. Can you stop doing it? What, what are you trying to tell me? Just say what you're trying to tell me. I'm not the type of person that's a follower and you, and if you give me good advice and I, but, and I agree with you, I'm going to do the good advice and I'm not going to blame you if it fails. Because that's the fear that therapists have is that if I do give you advice and you take the advice and advice doesn't work for you for whatever reason, hmm. you have an out to blame me that it didn't work, even though you had the choice to do it. I'm hmm. not like that. Just, just say what you guys said. You know, and I... And I used to tell her that all the time, like, you should please stop asking me those questions. And I had told her, I said, you ask me questions that's, that are irrelevant. And she looking at me like, what? But again, somebody else, they will be upset that I said that. Like, but it's the truth. You're asking me irrelevant questions. They have nothing to do with nothing. And mm-hmm. I think I'm a little bit harder on it because I'm a therapist too. So it makes it worse. But <laughs> the point that I'm trying to make is it you have to learn people's temperament and know the way they think. And the only way to do that is you got to test the waters and see how they respond to stuff when you ask them questions. Um, and that's that also goes into really listening to what a person say, because as a therapist, I listen to what people say and what they don't say. And I know people always be like, how the heck you listen to what people don't say also? Because if I have a person who we're talking about family of origin and I'm growing up. I've had people, they'll talk about their whole family. Mm. By the end of it, they never said one thing about their father or one thing about their mother or their sibling yeah. or whatever. That's interesting because I don't care about what you said. Now I'm more interested about why did you leave that out? 
because it's something there that you may not even realize that you avoided or you may be intentional. I don't know. But guess what? Now I'm curious. Hey, I noticed mm-hmm. that you talked about all this, but you never said nothing about your dad. Or remember when you told me that your mom, um, like I had one uh, client where she was like, she in drug and alcohol treatment and said, I had a great mother. She gave me everything that I've always wanted. I was like, she, like, she was just an amazing mom. You know, she just drank alcohol. Mm-hmm. Now, the part that you, you know, so everybody heard that. But what people don't hear is, if she was drinking alcohol, how is she really a good parent? Because now that's so now I'm curious. So what kind of alcoholic was she? Did she drink so much that everybody knew that she was an alcoholic? Or was she just an alcoholic that she might drink once or twice on the weekends or something like that? Like can you tell? Oh, everybody knew she was a drunk. I said, so if everybody knew she was a drunk, she was always drunk. She gave you everything that you need materialistically. That's what you said. So who was there for you emotionally? Because now I need to know emotionally who was there for you. She was like, well, uh, was she? Well, no, not really, because she was always passed out. Oh, she was always passed out. So she emotionally neglected you. Well, yeah. To her, the whole situation of how happy she was to have this mom when she was neglected. Mm. So basically... I was going to say, basically, dysfunctions prevent people from having good relationships and communication skills. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to talk to, it starts with kids. You have to talk to your kids. And even if you're punishing them, I know people will say that's the weirdest thing ever, but I always used to ask my kids, like, why are you in trouble? What did you do that made you in trouble? Why do you think that I'm upset about what you did? Like, I make them really think about all of the things that happened because, again, it helps them to to make decisions. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I, I question them about everything. And then I enforce the punishment, whatever the punishment is. Or if it's a natural consequence, I'll be like, so... Why do you think that that happened after you did X, Y, and Z? You didn't do your homework and you got an F. Why do you think that happens? Well, because I didn't put forth the effort to do I make them talk it out. And even as they're talking about friends or something like that, like I had my oldest son one time came home and was like, oh my God, mom, this girl in my class, she gets on my nerves. She's so annoying. She keep making this noise. I said, she's annoying. Why is she annoying you? Oh, because like the noise is just, you know, it's just, annoys me I like I said so she's not so you not accepting her for who she is because no it was like she that's how she laughed and I said so you're not accepting her for the way her voice sounds I was like could she really help that her laugh is like that and he like well no not really like that's just the way her voice sounds and I'm like so you're judging her based off of something that's out of her control is that is that fair to her because when you do stuff like that it makes people really think that you should be more accepting of people's differences. Mm -hmm. But then also too, like, hey, well, I don't like being touched like that. My friends know that. And I have friends that's touchy-feely. But because we know each other, sometimes she'll be like, and she's like, I'm sorry. I'm not going to touch you. I'm like, thank you. But if she do, because she forget, I don't say anything either. Mm -hmm. Because it's like making... Sessions. So I have a, then I have another question with you bringing that up with communication. If a person has a, a BPD, right, uh, or, or some type of dysfunction, personality dysfunction, for those who don't understand these terms, um, would that affect their communication skills, make them not effective? Or I give you one example. One day I was giving a lecture and there's a sister in the community at the time. She's schizophrenia, right? She has schizophrenia. She's bipolar. She'd be diagnosed with bipolar and schizophrenia, right? Mm-hmm. So um, she's mad with me to this day, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one day she has mentioned, she came, I was giving a lecture to a group of people and they were laughing. I gave a small little joke and they was laughing. So she interrupted the lecture by asking for um, some donations at the time, right? She's sending one of her children in. Mm-hmm. So the people was laughing from the, a joke I said previous before the child acts and I told the child, I wrote a letter telling the mother, I, you know, I'm in the middle of giving a lecture. You don't notice I'm lecturing people. 
This is not the time to ask for that. I wrote that as a response. I didn't say it on a microphone. I didn't say no one could hear me. I wrote it down on a piece of paper, told the mother, I'm lecturing. I can't do this right now while I'm lecturing. She knows better, right? So the mother interpreted that. The Wait, laughing. Stop. Wait a second. Yeah. Did you hear what you just said about what, she, what you perceive? You said she knows better. You made the assumption. Yeah, I know her. I know her. There's somebody I know. She knows. She knows better. Trust me. She knows better. So, but she interpreted it. The people's you. laughing at the joke that they were laughing at her. That everybody was laughing at her. And she wrote it out on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. I wrote the answer. And I think I told the son, not right now, right? I wrote it out, the answer, and I told him. She said the people were laughing at her. <laughs> <laughs> you got me? And I said to her, how you feel? How? And she asked one of her grown sons to call me. And I didn't know she had a BPD. I didn't know that she had been diagnosed with this. So she, her grown son called me. And he was like, yeah, man, why are you making fun of my mother? I was like, making fun of your mother? I was like, what happened? He's like, yeah, my mother came, asked for something. and said the people was laughing at her in the mass shit. I said, your mother, do your mother got a mental health issue? He's like, yeah. I said, oh, what, what's her mental health issue? He, he told me what it was. I said, nobody, no one's laughing at your mother. I was, she was in the, I was in the middle of a lecture and she asked. And he's like, yeah, his my mother got, you know, this problem, right? And so does these type of mental health issues affect a person's communication skills? Okay, so I want to go back to the beginning, your interpretation. You're like, I know her, and I know she knows better, right? Mm. It doesn't mean she know better. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you why. You, you're making the assumption. When mm. people have certain disorders, especially mm. if they unmedicated, it actually breaks down and deteriorates. She medicated. She, she was medicated. Trust me. She was medicated. Yes. taking her Listen to what I'm saying to you because you're making assumptions. This is how communication breaks down. Mm. I'm telling you, like right now, my mother is medicated. She takes mm. her medication for bipolar disorder, blah, 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 blah. But it's just certain things my mother just does not understand. You would think she understands because she can have a logical conversation with you and you won't think nothing of it. But then she'll say something and you'll be like, wait, like, no, you can't possibly think that way. And I'm going to give you an example, right? And this is a very, very personal example. My mother, when I tell you she's very intelligent, one day, one of my childhood friends reached out to me that I haven't talked to since we were children. And I was so excited. So I was like, Mom, oh my God, look, my one of my girlfriends just reached out to me that I haven't talked to since we were kids. And I read her the message. And I was like, isn't that great? And she was like, oh, my gosh, she sound like she's growing up. I was like, I know, right? I was like, like she's really an adult now. She said, because you know she was out there, right? So I'm like, wait, huh? You know, because it's just like, what, like, what do you mean? She was, like, you, she was like, yeah, her mom told me that she used to mess with her boyfriends. So I'm like, mom, you do realize that the last time we saw her, she was 11 years old. So if her mom said that she was messing with her boyfriend, you do realize that that's called rape, right? A child cannot initiate sex. You do realize that. And she was looking at me. But anybody who have known, if, they, if you was to ever meet my mom, you would have never thought she would think like that. Because in general, she can have a regular conversation. And she's very intelligent, especially streetwise. But certain areas is like, is eroded and mm. i was like so she just walked away but this is not the first time i've had a conversation with my mom about stuff like this mm. but it surrounds that particular kind of thing so when you like oh i know she knows better because i know her it may not necessarily mean that she she may know better not to interrupt the lux uh, lectures but in her mind she might be like oh my god you know I need donations because my kids are starving. Let me ask. And then so when she asks, because it's like, this is important to her. She's not thinking about that you're doing a lecture. She's thinking about, I need to make sure these basic needs are being met. And then when you said no, even though they were already laughing and stuff like that, let's just say 
somebody at that moment because again it's about perception let's just say at that moment when you wrote it back and, and it got sent back and she read it somebody started laughing louder but they made had a joke over there and she like they laughing at me even though that's not what's happening mm -hmm. but again when people have mental health disorders especially if they went years or some time without being medicated they brain deteriorates over time and even if they are medicated depending on what kind of mental health disorder, how bad it is, medications don't work. It may appear to work because they may stop having delusions, but other things are still um, being impacted because especially with schizophrenia, you have positive symptoms and you have negative symptoms. And basically like positive symptoms are having the delusions and all that kind of stuff that's, you know, stuff that's being added. The hallucinating stuff, trust me. Yeah, yeah those see. are positive symptoms. You know, mm -hmm. those are the best symptoms to have because when you get medication, it works. But when you have negative symptoms, which is things that are taken away, sometimes people, they might, you know, people who have schizophrenia, they might have flat affects and they, you know, they seem like they always, um, so like, it may seem like empathy was taken away, like stuff that have, that makes people, quote, normal or taken away. Some of those things that are taken away, you can't put them back even though they have medications. Hmm. And that's why I say mm -hmm. you may assume that she may know because you're like, oh, I know them. They would have never done this in this instance. But again, it's about perception. So in this particular perception, it may not always be the case. Um, mm -hmm. So again, sometimes even if, she, and what's even more strange and what you should have really realized that the person really don't know is because if you know your mother have a mental health disorder, because trust me, I'm quite sure this is not the first time she's done something like this. Mm. Like that, usually they do the same thing over and over and over again. That's my first experience with her, actually. No, that was your first experience. First. What I'm saying is, a son mm. who grew up with my mother, mm. this was not his first experience. Or his right, it was not his first life. experience. Yeah, he explained that with me. He explained, he explained these things. So, yeah. what kinds of mental health issues do he have to even say, let me call when you know that you're, this is stuff that your mother did? And he does have mental health issues too. <laughs> I know because it just it would just make logical sense. Yeah. He does. So I, that's mm. why I said. And he's not getting medicated, and he, uh, the, to my knowledge. Not, but that's my point. Sometimes you gotta listen to what people say because I heard what you said, and even as you explained the story, I said, "Oh, her son got mental health issues." Yeah, I already knew, even though you didn't say it, because yeah. you have to if you know that your mother is like this. And you call and question about people laughing at her, knowing that her behavior, people probably wasn't laughing. They was laughing at something else. And you know that this is how she is. And even as I say, you're like, yeah, that's how she is. But then why did you call? Mm. Because in my mind now, you know, because I was working as the imam that time. This is my first experience dealing with people like this. Right. And. And I start yeah, noticing yeah. there's a lot of people like this in the community, especially black in the black community. People you know? that have mental health issues. Uh -huh. They stay you coming people, to the mask. You said people like mask. this. Like her, I mean, uh, her case, and her case, I don't want to mention because she be cursing me out. She be inboxing me sometimes. But she be cursing me out. But I have met other peoples in her same scenario, same situation. But at the time working as the imam, think about it. The, the average Muslim imam Mm -hmm. He does know about Islamic rulings, right? Mm -hmm. So I, at the time, understood about Islamic rulings. Somebody who's in mental health, okay, so, certain things they is not obligatory on them and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. But now dealing with them in the community, that's a whole different experience. How to pinpoint when somebody has a mental health issue and then how to deal with that person because you can't deal with them like the, a normal Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. So that met, start meeting like, I'm very honest. A lot of people who are mentally ill, they come to me. I go to the masjid. They see me. They know me. They come ask for help. Um, I talk to some of them. Um, and then I start noticing, I hope I'm not crazy because they, they come. Wherever I go, wherever I'm working at, in the masjid, the Muslim community, the people know me. They come. They ask for help. Or I try to help them. Some of them need shelter. Some of them got problems with getting a medication. Some mm -hmm. of them have problems with um, their health care. Some of them, you know, they have a lot of them have financial problems, even though they get uh, a disability. I don't know. They spend all their money, you know, 
So I meet a lot of them in, working in the community, but I notice the general people in the community don't know how to deal with them. They like shun them away, run them out the masjid. Uh, they treat them harsh. So I try not to be like this. Cause one day I told one of them one day, um, a sister that, uh, cause they be, they be, they be, they be, they own drugs and got mental health. So they be doing stealing. So one day I told the sister, yo, you and your husband can't stay in the masjid right now. I ain't got nothing for you. I know the husband, he's, he's on drugs, right? Mm. And I know they still. So when she left, I didn't know she was really looking for something. My wife at the time was saying that that lady was crying. When you said that, she was crying. I seen her in a woman's side crying. I said, yeah, her husband, this guy's a thief. And we caught him before. Mm. So some people don't know how to deal with them, their situations. Then you have those from them who's on drugs and stuff like that. And then when they come to communicate and people talk with them, people shun them off. You know, this is the big thing in the, some the inner cities. This is the big issue. Like I know a sister right now. They come to me on Facebook. She is schizophrenia, right? Mm -hmm. And I tell her that she needs to. She she always fall into Zena, actually. So I told the sister one of her solutions could be because she has uh, she is she's diagnosed with being schizophrenia. And I know people who are bipolar like her, some of them have uh, over-sexualized, the best way to say it, right? Mm -hmm. So I told her the what she could do is go to the masjid, start communicating with the women in the community and build a relationship with the women, but she's anti-social. So when she goes to the masjid, she says, the people don't want to talk to me there. I said, are you sure? Or you don't want to talk to the people there? So... You know, and then she says that no one reaches out to her. And I said, what's the nationality? No one's black. She said they are mostly um, uh, Indians, Desi Muslims and Arabs. I said, OK, it could be true. But no one know how to treat them. And people might see something's wrong with them, but their communication skills and, and people who are, in, who are saying don't know how to communicate. So what's some solutions for people like this? Because trust me, I meet a lot of them wherever I go. <laughs> But one, you can stop saying um, you meet a lot of them. <laughs> you know, okay. I meet people with mental health issues, you know, because when you say them, you're ostracizing them already. I meet mm -hmm. them. That's like if you go into a community and, it's, and a, a white person, if a white person came and be like, yeah, I tried to talk to them. What you want to assume? Like, what you mean? Mm, yeah. So let's, you know. They, you know, some I talked to some people who had mental health issues. They struggle with mental health um, concerns because they are not their mental health. Just like I am not my skin color. Um, that's one is, you know, learning that. But the real thing is people need to learn how to treat themselves first. I can't expect you to show somebody respect and be respectful and inclusive when you're not respectful and inclusive of your own self. Mm -hmm. You don't even respect yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you're doing things that put your own self in harm's way. Like I have a neighbor right now who she, on Mother's Day, she was arguing with this guy. She was like, yeah, you know, my boyfriend and he smoked crack. And I'm like, why are you with somebody? Which you got your own house, you got your own place, you got all this. You, you're messing with somebody who is utilizing substances to cope with his emotions. Mm -hmm. But then why would I expect you to treat someone else kindly when you don't even know your own worth and being with somebody who would treat you kindly. Mm -hmm. So first it always starts with our own self of getting the help that we need to value our own self. Then self-esteem. Um, people love that word. Like you got to raise your self-esteem. That's really not how it works. I call self-esteem others esteem. Because how do people learn how to have self-esteem? You know, you know how people learn how to have self-esteem? How is that? We pour in our children how, what, what they're good at. That's how it starts. When they're growing up, you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. You're good at math. You're good at writing. You're good at reading. You're good at this. This is amazing. And you basically build up your child. But if you tear them down, then they have low self-worth. So then they have to reparent themselves. So it starts there. First, as parents, we have to try not to 
put on our children our own baggage that we grew up with. That's one. To build their self-esteem. So when they grow up, you ever realize, and I mean this with love, and I'm not saying this is true for everyone. You ever realize that women who are like are physically pretty to people, I'm going to say people because that's just because, you know, they have lower self-esteem than women who don't. Right. I noticed that. Yes. And I think it's because when women or and men have daughters that maybe not as pleasing to the eye, not always, I noticed that they'd be like, don't let nobody tell you nothing. You're pretty. You're this. You're that. So then they walk around like they hot shot. And I'd be like, go ahead, girl, do your thing. And then the ones who are pretty, you be like, you know, and you be like, she's always seeking attention. She always seeking this. Because then you will notice that when she was growing up, her mom be like, yeah, she thinks she cute. You know, blah, blah, blah. And she need to sit her behind down somewhere. She's too hot and she's too fresh. And that's what we do. We don't even realize we're tearing them down. So then you have these adults that's like who are keep looking for outside validation who are actually are, quote, pleasing to the eye than those who are not. Because we understand that that's true. But for some reason, we have gotten far away from that. So one, you have to start with or how we raising our children, but also to start and to love ourselves. If we didn't get there to start reparenting ourselves, to love ourselves, because when we start to love ourselves, we get to love other people. Mm-hmm. And you cannot say, and you cannot say that you love your neighbor who may have a mental health condition. I mean, you can't say that you love a lost spin island and you love his messenger when you can't even love the person that you see that's right next door. Correct. Correct. Correct, correct. Like I'm sorry, that just doesn't even make sense to me. And and, and, and I was saying that also go with the argument. I just want to say for the people on Facebook, my associates and friends, people follow. There's some brothers that say, you know, I don't want to marry sister with kids, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, they are burdened. So you know, sister with kids, they, they're worthless. And I was letting some brothers know, well, those Muslim kids, they have they're your brothers in Islam. They have honor. So when you talking, when you saying these things, you're talking about Muslim children also. You know, so that I'm thinking about when you just said it, 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 it it's mm-hmm. also answers that. Continue, please. I mean, to cut you off. No, 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 that's fine. Okay, I think that was very important too to say um, something like that. Um, and you have to, so yeah, it start with you. You know, you have kids instilling on them there. Because when people who love themselves, they're more loving to other people. Mm. I can only dish out what's in me. If mm. I'm miserable, mean, and all like, I mean, if I'm miserable, mm. how can you expect me to be happy with other people? I, I can't. That's really difficult. And if I am doing that, because I do know some people who are like miserable on the inside, but when you meet them in public, um, they seem all happy. However, over time, they get more miserable. And who usually who get impacted are the children and the people that's what's inside the home. Mm. You know, the ones that, oh, they're so nice in the public and then in the home, they they abusive. It's those people. You know, um, so that's number one. You got to do that. But then one of the things that I tell people all the time, because we had this, you know, in America, they always say, oh, treat people how you want to be treated. I don't I don't I don't do that. And I know you might be like, why, why would you? I treat people how they want to be treated. Mm. And that requires that I get to know them. Mm. Your likes, your dislikes. Now, initially, I might treat you how I want to be treated, like general respect that everybody have. But even still, general respect may be to me, may not be to you. Because I know in some cultures, um, uh, I know in a part of Asian culture, I can't remember who, which one, looking someone in the eye is disrespect. Mm-hmm. But I won't know that until I get to know them. And then in America, not looking somebody in the eye, I mean, you're lying. So mm-hmm. it's important to get to know people. And I know it was another culture that if you... It's, it's from the sooner really not to look people in the eye. <laughs> Lower no. your gaze a little bit. Even, even men with men a little bit in mm-hmm. Islam. Maybe. But... You know, definitely with women, you know, definitely. <laughs> the men with women, definitely, you know, you don't look them in the eyes and stuff like that. But in America, people take that as disrespect, especially mm-hmm. women. Oh, you don't like women because you're not looking me in my face and stuff like that. People, yes, okay. Mm-hmm. 
Or um, I know it's one culture that if you show the bottom of your feet towards them, that's disrespectful. And mm -hmm. so it requires that you really get to know people. But you know what? You got to be open to the mm -hmm. feedback. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, in my culture, that's disrespectful, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. And be okay with it and be open to those things. Mm -hmm. And when you are open like that, when people who have mental health mental health issues come and say hey i don't like to be treated this way it gives you some concessions but also it doesn't mean though that you have to deal with all of their behavior because again they're not stupid mm -hmm. they just have some mental health issues and sometimes it might be like hey let's have this conversation um you still have to get the appropriate help that you may need uh, especially uh people who like have personality disorders mm -hmm. um you you got to get the help that you need, and if you don't you want know, help, like I don't mean to cut you off, but you no, know, I can remember another scenario with a different person. Um, I ne I never knew they had a mental health issue until one day I seen them. Id Salah is Id Salah. We're we're about to pray. Id is a sister, and she walks up in front of me. You know how homeless people are homeless in the streets? Mm -hmm. How their clothes are? She looked just <laughs> like that, and she said her hair was crazy, and she said. Talking about something crazy, and I was like, "It's like, is it? It's a lot." And I was like, and then I seen her normal like a couple of months ago. Then I, you know, and then I was talking to her. She came back to the masjid, and I was talking with her later on after. And she's like, her husband put her on her, and she lost her children. And but reality, she has schizophrenia, and she refused to take the medication. Yeah, and because of that. Her, one of her children was they found him on a train. He was like he's like eight years old. That's kind of a... You know, and then I was like, and in the community, when these people come to the Muslim community, in this particular community, people don't want to help them. The mm -hmm. the people board masters, the boards of masters. That's why I, I told myself I really don't never want to work for a Muslim a masjid. I'd rather start my own thing because the board, a lot of masjid, if those people can't bring in money. Through donations, they don't care about them. All right. So, how you deal with people like this? And because like when you start to talk with them, who's people like I'm this? sorry. How you deal with people who have issues, mental health issues, refusing to take medication? Mm -hmm. And I tell them in the conversations when we sit down, Islamic Q and A. I show them it's permissible to take those psych meds. Mm -hmm. Some of them would tell me. It's they need a rukia. I say, okay, it's permissible to do rukia and take psych medication. They don't want to do it. They, you know, they don't want to do it. They would tell me, no, my husband put the sihr on me, and I don't, and I don't need the medication. I just need the rukia. We do rukia. They don't get no response from it. How you deal with the peoples who are refusing? Who is the people? Get, or the individuals? In the community who have mental health, who needs help. Thank you for correcting my language. <laughs> um, the thing about it is, you got to think about it. If I have schizophrenia, right? A lot of times I have delusions. So it's not reality. So it's even more that you have to be patient that that's not real. Um, mm -hmm. So I like, and a lot of people who do have schizophrenia, a lot of times they have delusions of persecution. So delusions of persecution and things like that are really, really hard for people to um, realize that they got an issue. Um, it's easier when people have um, uh, delusions where they hear stuff but don't see it. Like those, those are easier. But when they have like delusions of persecution and all those kinds of things, I tell people all the time, a lot of times people that have delusions, their delusions are usually based in some type of reality. And I know you might be like, how the heck is that? So I'm going to give you an example with this one um, person that I knew who, they was like, my family poisoning me. My family is poisoning me. And I'm like, really? Your family poisoning you? But again, I told you I always have that, the idea that some tr it's always some truth in it. Come to find out the family was putting their medication in their food. Now, to them, you're poisoning me. You know, you put in something in my food that I don't know what it is you're trying to poison me. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it was this other guy who he used to come to a group. It was one, one of my friends. He used to say that people was following him. That was like his delusion. Um, that the army was going to come get him. They was following him and blah, 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 blah. Then one day he got arrested. Yeah, the police is following you. <laughs> you know, what's the army? It's the police. Oh, gotcha. You know, so it's a lot of times it is based in some type of reality. So again, it's always there, you know, being inquisitive. But what sometimes people don't know too is that a lot of the psych meds, the ones that do realize that they wind up having a problem, they start taking psych medications. The medications be so harsh on their bodies and they get sick, so they don't want to take it. Um, and instead of like saying like, oh, go take medication, say, hey, you know, the next time you go to an appointment, um, no, I can't, I might not be able to be there physically, but hey, like, let me be there to advocate for you with your doctor. Cause it may be, hey, doctor, um, she's not taking her medication. You know, I did talk to her. She said, it's making her feel this way. That's why she stopped. Can, is there some, another option? Because a lot of times they're not going to say that because they don't think it's another option because people don't show up to their appointments with them. People don't advocate for them. And one thing about doctors is they're going to push whatever they think that they want to. They're not going to listen to the person when they say, I don't feel well. I don't feel like myself. I feel like a zombie because a lot of times they become zombie-like too, where it's just like there, there's no semblance of what they used to be and it's a hardship mm -hmm. so um not saying that you have to be the only person but having a team of people that if they came through the door it's like okay i know with such and such or i know such and such every time october come because her mom died in october she stopped taking her meds you know let's get her some um make sure she has support around october to make sure that she keeps taking her meds I know, and this is why I said it's important to get to know people. I know Judy down the street. She started taking her meds, but we know every four months she feels like she's doing so much better and that she's cured. She no longer needs the medication. So it's January now. So in March, let's start having some people around her to make sure that she's continuing her medication once she get over that hump. You know, put her inside a support group that we know for sisters that take medications and you know whatever the case may be that may be helpful for the person so again it's about getting to know mm. your the people that's there and when you get to know them you can anticipate their needs when you get to know them you know um so like it's just so making it some some, some type of support Team, I'll keep that in my mind now. Next time I'm in that type of, if I'm in that particular minute again, working in these communities, I know exactly what to do. So make like yeah. a support. Mm -hmm. uh, what a, now, now, I know we got a little bit off topic, but not I really, really want to know. And not really. And the reason why is because it's a, this is all still about communicating with the entire people. Because if I know, again, like say if I have a group of people where I know Susie, Joe, Milan, whoever, they have mental health issues. So then I have my group of people where I'd be like, hey, um, once a month, we're going to go around to these individuals' houses, make sure that they have their bare necessities. Hey, do you got your medications? Hey, do you got soap, bread, blah, 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 blah. Make sure you have all these essential basic needs being there. Is there anything that I can do for you? But Because when you do that and it makes people feel like you care, it makes them less likely to want to go for their medications too because they want to continue to have the interaction with other people. Mm. You know? I think to make this the last and final question because it's, it's been over an hour. Mm. Why people like, why people who have mental health issues, mm -hmm. marriages don't work. Why do people who don't have mental health issues, marriages don't work? Well, I, I find the ones who who have mental health issues, like schizophrenia, bipolar, from the women, I find that they always marry and divorce, like once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. And I've seen women who don't have mental health issues marry once or twice a year. I told you Philly is special. I keep on telling you that. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, um, I can't, so because, mm. because this is my experience mm. um, outside of Philly, I don't see, I don't see my companions, brothers and sisters in New York marrying two times a year, except for those 
individual who have mental health. I knew somebody who didn't have no mental health issues. They was married for two days. <laughs> I seen that too in Philly. Yeah, I seen that in Philly. Yeah, I seen that in Philly. Yes, outside of Philly, I haven't seen that, but in Philly, yeah, I've seen that a yeah. lot. Uh, but um, yeah. I think too, um, it's about. I don't think it's it's about more than likely. Not. I don't know for sure, but it's probably because of the lack of transparency. Mm-hmm. But um, so if I meet a sister or a brother who had mental health issues, but no one knew about it, and you know, because actually, I no, matter of fact, I had a brother tell me that, that he that a sister didn't tell him that she had um mental health issues, and when they got married, she had all these psychotropic medications, and it just went left. Where if somebody is honest about what what's going on with the person, it might be easier to deal with because they know what to expect. So like I used to do, I did foster care for a little while and they, and just to give you an idea, like they were famous for not telling you everything that a child come with. So I had a girl come and I do hijama. Mm. And so of course I have raises in my house and stuff like that, stuff that you can cut yourself with. I, when she gets to my house, probably like a weekend, a weekend, I wound up seeing her wrist. They were all cut up. I said, why wouldn't you tell me this? Because she wound up finding my box of razors because I had a thousand of me. Well, I think it's a hundred. I'm not over exaggerating. It's a hundred razors in a box. So she took some and she went to town. And I'm like, if you would have told me that, I still would have accepted her. I just would have made sure I put shop or I mean shop shop objects away. So people gotta be honest about what they're dealing with before they get into a marriage. Mm-hmm. Okay, because uh, I noticed uh, the communication skill. I, you know, I, I some of the sisters I met who have mental health and the brothers. That some of the divorce I noticed when one of the spouse or both of them have a BPD, but they're not getting it. They're not getting the issue taken care of. So I might find a sister. She might be narcissistic, or the brother might be narcissistic. Or the brother might have um, some type of behavioral problem. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not being dealt with. But when they are married, these are the reasons why they're having the, the fallouts or the there's a problem with the communication, for example. I give you an example. I was talking to a sister. She was from Nigeria. She wanted to, her husband, they was married like for a week. He divorced her, right? Mm-hmm. And he's a doctor. The brother's a doctor. And the sister, she's into the business world. And I'm trying to understand a doctor. You marry a brother's a doctor. You got the divorce in a week over some, she asked him something. So when I approached the brother, I called him because she wanted, he wanted to get from her the wedding ring, the, the maha, which is a very expensive ring. So I was telling him because he gave her talak, that's his, that's her right to keep the ring. He was taking her to court. So when I was talking to him, Man, this guy, I couldn't get even two minutes on the phone with this guy. I mean, he was very narcissistic. Sometimes I think people have uh, some of these behavior problems, and this is causing problems in their communication with their spouse and with other people. Mm-hmm. How can we a little bit, what are some mechanism we can use to have better communication skills with us, because the Muslim community, especially the African American Muslim community, we don't have unity with each other. A lot of it is egos and communication. How can we fix some of the communication issues? So, like some of us don't know how to disagree. We disagree. It's like we want we want to talk to this person. Never. I have somebody right now. Her brothers will disagree with me over something small. Block, delete. I'm never talking to this guy. And I'm like, the thing that we disagree about. It shouldn't cause us to never want to talk to each other. Well, don't take it personal because a lot of times when people respond like that, it's because it's already something that they believe about themselves. Mm. When, whenever you see someone overreact about anything, it's because they already believe it in themselves. They're going to deny it. They're going to tell you that you're being disrespectful. But the truth of the matter is they believe it. So I, I, I always like to use myself as an example. Um, growing up, my dad used to call me stupid all the time. I used to hate it. 
So now, whenever I interpret that someone is trying to call me stupid, it makes my blood boil. I know I'm smart. Obviously, like I went and got a master's degree, you know, good grades with, I could did it in my sleep. But a part of me still, I know, believes that. So it still is a trigger for me. But I don't have nothing to do with you. Mm. It's me. Mm. Period. And so when it, whenever you see somebody overreact about something, you know, but like, why are you lying? You calling me a liar? Because you a liar. Like, you know. Mm. Or like, I've, I've been married before and I'll be talking to somebody and they'll be like, I'm not a weak man. And I'm like, I, I didn't say that, but I'm glad to know that you believe that you're a weak man. Okay, so now how can we deal with that? They're like, I don't think I'm a weak man. Guess you do. I never mm. said it. I never said it. That's your interpretation of what's happening because we're having a conversation about household chores and you feel like because we're having this conversation, you think you're weak or for whatever reason. I don't know. Like, you, so you... That's why I say you have to pay attention to what people say and what they don't say. Because what they don't say is just fillers. It really just fillers. Mm -hmm. It's the stuff that they don't say. And I'm not saying that it's always malicious or intentional. It's just that's how we were taught to communicate. Instead of saying, you know, Za, when we have these kinds of conversations and stuff like that, it makes me feel like I'm not being a good husband towards you. And so I try, I'm being real defensive and making it all about you. And then I feel weak or whatever the case may be. I don't know. But if someone ever overreacts to something, it's because they already believe it. Now, and I'm saying overreact. I'm not talking about you go and get in somebody's face and you punch them in the eye and then they try to punch you back in the eye and you be like, you overreact. Like, no. Like, I'm sorry. Like, a law does not like the transgressor. And if you transgress against someone, they're going to transgress against you too. You know, so don't do that. But what I'm saying is this, if you're having a conversation with somebody and somebody introduce something to the conversation that you never said or you, you didn't you weren't thinking like that. That's within themselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's very that's good. That's good. Wait to see it. People do do that all the time, but we're leading. But with how can we fix that? Like for example, we talk about black people's issues and coming together. How can we fix that? Because I see our peoples. Mm -hmm. We would disconnect. Just communicate over the smallest little thing. And that caused a lot of issues for the black community, not getting stuff, getting things together as a unit. You know, especially I, I, I try to promote on my on my Facebook page, um, ethno aggregation. But mm -hmm. I noticed the smallest little thing, we fall out, then we want to deal with each other no more. Mm -hmm. Especially amongst African American Muslim is very common in African American Muslim mm -hmm. community. Well, one, we got to be proactive. So being proactive is raising our children, brother, to deal with conflict and uh, corrective feedback. That's number one. We have to do it because the problem is we don't even correct our kids. And I've seen parents. I've seen it. Parents, they child would do something wrong and then maybe an adult will correct them. And they're like, don't talk to my, don't tell my kid what to do and blah, 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 blah. And then so basically it, it teaches the child that can't nobody correct you or say nothing to you whatever you do is what you do and you have there's no consequences so when people do they never learn how to handle corrective feedback thank you tiffany you never learned how to deal with corrective feedback you have to but also to starting to be accountable for your own behavior that's the hardest thing ever. It is the hardest thing ever. But I'm telling you, it is so worth it when you hold yourself accountable and you take ownership. But then don't hold yourself hostage to it either. Um, because it's a lot of things that I've done in my life that's like absolutely insane and, and, and crazy. And people that ask me about it, I'm like, yeah, I did that. I apologize. Whoever it was, if I wrong them, I apologize. I'm sorry. Um, inshallah, it will never happen again, but I'm a work in progress because, again, it depends on which trigger you you 
well, not which trigger that you activate, which triggers that's still inside me that I'm working on. Um, I have to take ownership for that. And if you don't do it, you're going to continue to always point the finger at everybody else. You can't do that. You cannot do that. It's, it doesn't work. You will always be unhappy. And that's just the bottom line of it. Like, it just really is like, and I've done some crazy things in my life that people be like, you did it. And I'd be like, yep, sorry. Let me make Toba. I really hope that you forgive me. If you don't, I'm okay with that too. You know, cause I'm not perfect. I'm okay with that. If you don't want to deal with me, may you have a great life. And you and you move on, but you have to take accountability. You just have to, because it's not, it's not everybody else. I'm sorry, it's just not everybody else. Like I was writing my memoir, and I think I was like, by 34 years old, I had five divorces. I have a problem. Not, I had five divorces. Oh, these men, they don't know how to. No, it's me. It's me. Mm-hmm. I chose them. I chose. Them. I could have not chose them. I could have not got married. I could have fought harder for my marriage. I could have done a number of a numerous things, but mm-hmm. that didn't happen. That's on me. I had to take responsibility for the part that I played in it. Mm-hmm. Period. I can't mm-hmm. go around blaming everybody because then nothing changes, and I keep repeating the same cycle. I have mm-hmm. that control, not other people. Mm-hmm. So we have to be proactive. Raising our children better. Two, we have to hold ourselves accountable. And number three, we got to stop being so sensitive. I know people, I know that's a bad thing that people always like to say like, oh, and what I mean by stop being so sensitive, I'm not saying not have emotions. I'm not saying to suppress their emotions. What I'm saying about stop being so sensitive is that you're so hard-headed that when somebody says something, you become so emotional and you reject everything that the person is saying because you in your feelings. Mm. Feelings are information. Feelings are information. It's not reality. It's information. Basically, when you're angry, it's saying you feel passionate about this situation. What's going on? You're sad. Hey, something hurt my feelings when the situation happened. What happened? I'm feeling jealous. I'm feeling jealous because they have something that I don't have. What can I do to get the thing that I want and not from them? (laughs) What can I do to get the same thing that I'm jealous over? Oh, they got a promotion. I want a promotion. Well, they did X, Y, and Z. Well, then I need to go out and do X, Y, and Z so I can try to get a promotion. Or, you know, a lawful item, the promotion is not for me. Maybe I go lateral to somewhere else. But we have to be open to different ways of thinking and not have this linear thinking pattern. Like, you got to color your world with possibilities. That's the best way I, I can explain it is coloring your world with possibilities. Because even when I'm talking to somebody and I just like, I ask like, I wonder why they think that way. I don't just be like, oh, they think that way because of this. I'm like, well, maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. I wonder which one. Like I start like literally playing a narrative until it all starts to make sense about who, why the person is the way that they are. And we got to do that for everybody and even within ourselves, mm. you know, and like that whole um, like, I'm just starting to try to get over like being physically reactive to people um, when stuff happened. And because I had to realize like growing up, no one protected me. So now that I'm older, I'm overcompensating by protecting myself more than what needs to be done Mm -hmm. out of fear. And a lot of times, a lot of of our women do that. A lot of our women, they do that. Mm -hmm. It's about fear. But then when you have, and then if I start to understand that about myself, I can start correcting it. But then when you become vulnerable and you tell other people about it, like, hey, this is what happens to me. This is why I react this way. This is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm trying to do. It gives people, too, an opportunity to say, hey, I want to deal with it. Or no, I cannot deal with it because I have my own triggers and my own things. Because, And this is not going to work. But it but what people do is they hide it because they don't want to be rejected. It's not about being rejected. It's because what's going to happen is you get into the relationship without being vulnerable, without telling them. And then guess what? Now the real rejection happens because when they're there, they're like, I don't want you. Instead of saying, instead of at the beginning, if you say it, it's like, 
It's not that I don't want you. It's the behaviors I don't want. Mm, 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 Mashallah. It's very informative. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's just thinking about stuff differently. It's That's very, very informative. Make it, this special clip just for you saying all of that. <laughs> very informative. Um, it's definitely informal. Inshallah, we get to have some more of these type of conversations and videos like this. I think it's very beneficial. Um, especially to clear up our minds, a lot of misconceptions, how to better way see things and do things will bring about um, better results in our community with ourselves and our communities. I definitely want to thank you for your time and uh, ask Allah to give you good um, and that uh, what you have learned will benefit yourself and others with it. So let's conclude and inshallah, man, you know, I'll upload this video. So anybody who is watching, the sister has her own YouTube channel and Facebook page. I will make sure I put it in the description and anything related to her contact information. Um, I have it in the description. Do you want to say anything else before closing? Yes, because I think this is so important. If you reach out to me via Facebook Messenger, please, please, please ask a question with your salams. I don't want to ignore people, but men have a habit, not all men, but some men, they have a habit of, they say salam and then they ask me, am I married? I don't want to marry you. Like I'm so I'm just sorry. I just don't. I'm not interested in doing something like that right now. But that's number one. And don't ask your question just to later up follow up with why are you single? Um, I'm single because that's what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala want for me right now. Because if I if you want a marriage for me, I will be married. I'm not in a rush to do any of those things. So just ask your mental health question. That's it. If not, I will ignore you because uh, you know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says it's better to be silent. So I'm being mm. silent for a reason. Okay. So thank you, sister. Yeah. And like I said to anybody who's following, that you can always follow the description. And also, the sister have her YouTube channel. Um, please subscribe. I will add that to the description page and her information for a contact. All right. Salam alaikum, sister. Wa alaikum salam. Salam alaikum.